Week two of the Derek Chauvin trial kicked off today with some well, very powerful testimony. Minneapolis police chief taking the stand. He is the man who fired Chauvin and the other officers on the scene soon after Floyd died. The chief, he was questioned extensively about the department's use of force policy before they even mentioned the Floyd case. And during that Q&A, he mentioned the governing principle the Minneapolis PD. Thousands of calls that our men and women respond to. Uh, it is my firm belief that the one singular incident we will be judged forever on will be our use of force. And so while it is absolutely imperative that our officers go home at the end of their shift, we want to make sure and ensure that our community members go home too. And so sanctity of life is absolutely vital that that is the pillar for our use of force. A bit later, he was asked specifically about what Chauvin did to Floyd last Memorial Day, and he didn't hold back. It has to be objectively reasonable. We have to take into account uh, the circumstances, information, the threat to the officer, the threat to others, the severity of that. Uh, so that is not uh, part of our policy. That is not what we teach, and uh, that should be condoned. When do you believe, or do you have a belief as to when this restraint, the restraint on the ground that you viewed, should have stopped? Once Mr. Floyd had stopped resisting, and certainly once he was um, uh, in distress and trying to verbalize that, um, that, that should have stopped. Also today, we heard from the ER doctor who worked on Floyd at the hospital and pronounced him dead soon after he arrived. Was your leading theory then for the cause of Mr. Floyd's cardiac arrest oxygen, oxygen deficiency? That was one of the more likely possibilities. I felt that at the time, based on the information I had, it was more likely than the other possibilities. And, and doctor, is there another name for death by oxygen deficiency? Asphyxia is commonly understood. His comments about asphyxia are considered pivotal because the cause of death, a central part of this case, the medical examiner who conducted the autopsy said it was heart failure, but Chauvin's attorneys, they're saying that Floyd's drug use was a contributing, if not major factor, as he had both fentanyl and methamphetamines in his system when he died. Dr. Langenfeld, he was also asked whether CPR on the scene could have saved Floyd's life. Take a listen to his response. It's well known that any amount of time that a patient spends in cardiac arrest without immediate CPR um, markedly decreases the chance of a good outcome. Uh, approximately 10 to 15 percent decrease in survival uh, for every minute that CPR is not administered. And that point, particularly notable because Chauvin and the other officers did not perform CPR on Floyd even after he became unresponsive. As you may remember last week, an off-duty firefighter who came upon the scene frantically urged them to let her work on him, but they would not let her near Floyd. Come on. I'm a firefighter from Minneapolis. But look, well, you should check on him. He's not responsive oh, right now. Back off. off. He's not responsive. Look at him. Get off. Get off the street. He's not He's responsive right now. He's not responsive right now. He's not responsive right now, bro. Just give him a pulse. No, bro, look at him. He's not responsive right now, bro. Check him a pulse. Bro, are you serious? He's going to just let him sit there with that on his neck, bro? You call, you call what you do, you call what you doing okay, bro. Are you really a firefighter? Yes, I am from Minneapolus. Bro, you, 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 you call, you think that's okay? Check his pulse. Check his right now. His pulse. Get back in the Check, the man ain't moved yet, bro. The man ain't moved yet, bro. Where, where? Minneapolis. Okay. I want to bring in my guest, uh, more than equipped to get into this subject, and more Alvin Bragg, former Chief Deputy Attorney General of New York, where one of his duties was overseeing investigations when it came to law enforcement conduct. He's now a Democratic candidate for Manhattan District Attorney, also a law professor at New York Law School. Alvin, thank you for the time. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Just watching the footage again is always so so challenging to to, to watch um, thank you for being here this is a very sobering uh, topic obviously uh, to that end and given your experience is what's different about this case that video um, 
and the power of it, the testimony also pretty compelling. Um, is, is that one of the differences and the challenges that you've ran up against in this case? Everybody's seen the nine and a half minutes now. Well, look, ha having video evidence is certainly helpful. We have seen other cases, you know, you think of Rodney King comes to mind where there's a video, uh, and I'm familiar with video cases uh, where, uh, you know, we didn't get the, the, the result I believe we should have. Uh, but here, the, 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 the video is, is, is damning, in my view. Uh, and, of course, the defense is, is, is trying to uh, you know, point to other, uh, you know, issues. But the, the, the evidence of the videotape is, is, as I said, damning. So I think that, that, that does stand out uh, as obviously the centerpiece of this, 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 this trial. Help us, if you could, for the layman, what is the standard, given the three different criminal charges that the officer's facing, if, and we now know there was, there was drugs in the system, but where is the line between, you know, whether or not there was drugs in the system, he still had his knee on his neck, they didn't attempt to do CPR, um, he made the situation worse, and it was foreseeable that the outcome that happened could have happened given the actions on the ground. How important for the jury is it to know well, was it the drugs or was it the knee on the neck? How were they supposed to figure out where the line starts and stops? And so the defense is trying to you know, bring other issues into play. Here, if I'm the prosecution, this is straightforward. It's There's a knee on the neck uh, in any understanding of causation. Uh, this death does not occur were it not for Chauvin's knee on Mr. Floyd's neck. Uh, and I think saying that uh, as many times as is necessary to refute what I would say is uh, uh, obfuscation and, and, and distraction, uh, this this death does not happen uh, absent Chauvin's neck or, or knee on Mr. Floyd's neck, period, full stop. Help us behind the scenes, and I, and I mentioned your bona fides in terms of as a prosecutor, and, and imagine theoretically if you are the next DA Manhattan, there's three different charges the prosecutors are, are bringing against the officer, second and third degree murder, and also second degree manslaughter, as, as I understand. Why the three, and what are they doing in terms of setting expectations up for the public, but also at the same time giving options to a jury? Um, give me the strategy that's involved in charging him the way they have, and also at the end of the day, what they think would be a sufficient outcome to show that justice uh, was served. Right, so I, I don't know what they would think would be sufficient, uh, but you know, this kind of charging where you charge more than one count, you have a higher count and then what we call sort of a lesser included uh, offense is, is not uncommon. The, str the strategic decision is, you know, the top charge is the second degree murder, which is, you know, causing death, uh, you know, essentially while, while, while doing an assault without the intent to cause the death. Uh, I assume that that's, I mean, that they charge it, that's the conviction that they, they want, that's the top of the indictment. Uh, the strategy is you, you could charge that and, and perhaps nothing nothing else, uh, and because you really want the jury to lock in and re return that. You charge the other counts uh, just in case there's, there's, there's someone on the jury who doesn't want to do that top count, uh, for some reason doesn't believe that the, the evidence meets it. So you're right, it is a strategic decision uh, for the prosecution to include that uh, and to, 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 to give jurors an alternative way to reach a conviction. I mean, certainly they want the top conviction here, but they want a conviction. Uh, and so have decided not to have sort of a binary choice between convict of the top count or do not acquit, giving the jury other options. Uh, Alvin, as I mentioned off the top, you've been involved in prosecuting cases um, involving law enforcement and um, questions about use of force. It does seem uncommon, and maybe I'm wrong, but you have the police chief at the time and then also a senior lieutenant last week who in no way, um, but in uncertain terms, said, no, this guy was not following a police protocol here and what he did was wrong. Is that as uncommon as it seems? Yes. I mean, the, the, particularly the specificity uh, and the force uh, and the rank of, of those testifying. It is uncommon. In fact, there's a, there's a reverse phenomenon 
where you have in a, in a case involving uh, misconduct by an officer, you, you have to call police officers, let's say, to establish various things in the case. Uh, and, and you have a phenomenon of the defense being able to elicit things that maybe aren't really within the scope of that, uh, the, the incident, but it's basically sort of they're getting in other evidence, whether, oh, this officer is a, quote, good guy, or, hey, you know, my training at the Attic Academy was this, when they're not called by the prosecution for, for that purpose, but the defense, you know, kind of uses the fact that there's an officer who's, who, who may be necessary for one element for the, the, the prosecution to, to, to rely on, but, but in fact, the defense is using them basically as a, as a friend of the, of the officer to get in other evidence. So, so yes, this is uncommon, and, and generally we see the reverse. You know, Chief Banks, uh, the former, um, the top uniform officer in the NYPD, was his good friend of the show. He was on last week. And he said he doesn't remember a time in a high-profile case like this that there was unanimity among former police chiefs and leaders to say, no, no one's defending this one. What's on trial here more than what Derek Chauvin did that day in terms of our justice system? Uh, because if they don't get a conviction on this one, I, I don't know what to say. Yeah, I, I, I saw the president of the NAACP said last week, our, 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 our system is on trial. And given, as you just said, the sort of unanimity, I'm sure there's some dissents out there, but the near unanimity uh, from uh, even law enforcement here, uh, a non-conviction here would, I mean, I think even a conviction, we still need to sort of think about everything we need to change in our system, right? A conviction does not bring back uh, Mr. Floyd's life. Uh, so we still need to press ahead with with necessary reforms, but but a failure to have a conviction here really would uh, you know underscore and and, and expose uh, uh, such such deep issues, uh, and so I think it would be deeply troubling. Up next, Alvin Bragg. He will stick around. We're going to switch gears and we'll discuss the legal troubles Donald J. Trump is facing. Bragg, he worked on the Trump Foundation fraud case while at the New York AG's office, and he wants to be the next Manhattan DA. He'd take over for the Trump fraud case there. So the perfect guest to weigh in.